Without uh, grit, inspiration, and access, I wouldn't be the teacher I am today. And I certainly wouldn't be uh, the writer I am today uh, and get to see my work uh, at present uh, reaching out to a sort of larger audience. But before we go any further, I, I just want to get our terms sort of on the table. Um, grit, right? the ability to stoically endure and to keep striving. Right? Inspiration, you know, that which breathes the aspirational into us. But then access, um, which I think is really the genuine opportunity um, to engage circles of privilege. And, and as a result, to see one's potential uh, fully manifest. I was born in Boston uh, to a typically sort of atypical uh, Boston circumstance, maybe. My mother was one of eight from Southie. Uh, her father uh, was a drunk, her mother uh, a severe woman. <laughs> um, when she was about to enter high school, her father disappeared, and, and so she dropped out and helped raise her siblings. And that was the end of her formal education. She married at 18, married a heavy drinker, and he beat her and fathered two children with her and abandoned her shortly thereafter. My father grew up in Somerville on Winter Hill. He barely finished his first year of high school. By 15, he had already landed himself in some trouble. He and another teen from the same neighborhood followed a man home and they, they beat him severely and shot him in the back with his own gun. My father got 15 years to life. He was 15 years old, he got out at 30, met my mother, they married. He helped her raise her kids and then they had two of their own, my brother and I. We moved around a lot when I was a kid. We moved like people who were on the run. And in fact, as it later came out, we were. <laughs> um, when I was about uh, seven years old, uh, about our maybe 10th address, our car was um, exploded in our driveway. Someone blew it up. I remember my father kicking in our bedroom door and scooping my brother and I out of bed and us standing outside and watching the car burn. We woke up the next morning and my father was like, those crazy neighborhood vandals? Well, we're moving. And we moved to California. <laughs> Stayed there for four months and then we returned and uh, moved into another little quiet town just outside of Boston. I was eight, and it was also the age where my father started to assess me uh, as someone becoming a man. When he was a child, his mother boarded him out to a work farm. His father had passed away, she was struggling. And the farmer who he was boarded with believed in beatings. And, you know, he thought, you know, beatings were the backbone of the solid childhood. And so my father started engaging in what I like to call these, you know, little training sessions. Initially, what they were um, were little slaps upside the head. Right? This is how it started. I was a little fat redheaded kid, and I'd go to school and you know get picked on, and little fat redheaded kids do. And I'd come home after getting into fights, and he'd ask me if I won, and if I didn't, I got slapped in the head. So. Thus began my journey towards losing less fist fights. <laughs> the other aspect of these sessions was a sort of withholding of medical treatment, a kind of training in stoic disregard for my own pain. Medical uh, care would be withheld for some time and then ultimately granted. Now, all this um, would have perhaps been far too much to deal with. Uh, overwhelming, uh, ultimately destructive, if it hadn't been for my mother. She was 
very talented at loving her children, let's say that. She gave a kind of, as pure a love as you can as a human, and at least that's how I remember it. And because of her, I developed a sense of self-worth. They balanced each other out. My father would beat me down, and my mother would lift me up. And as a result, maybe somewhere in the middle, I also had around me uh, you know, some other inspirational examples. At this moment, when I was going through this, I, I, I began reading. My, my parents were readers, if nothing else. They devoured books. And so, you know, I picked up their reading habit. And I had a cousin um, who would later be instrumental in my life who noticed. And he came to me and he said, you know, oh, it's great, you know, keep it up. It's like, but look, don't read anything that isn't great until you can tell the difference between what's great and what isn't. <laughs> I had no idea how to employ that enigmatic advice. So what I did was I, I read uh, deeply in the canon, and I read the ancients. And then I got into the transcendentalists, and I really read as much as I could. Uh, it became you know, an intense habit as I moved through high school. And, and my writing kept up through high school. And, and even after high school. Now, my love of books, as it was, which ultimately would save me, did not protect me from certain other influences occurring at the time. By the time I was 17, my father and I were coming to loggerheads. We were verging on violence. And one evening, as I was headed out the door, he asked where I was going. And I told him I was going out. And he said, you know, I heard you, but uh, I asked where. And I said, no, no. out, and kept walking. Next thing I knew, he punched me between the shoulder blades and sent me face first into the front door. I turned around and looked at him, and he nodded at me, let me know that he was serious. And then he turned his back on me, and I punched him in exactly the same spot and sent him to his knees. He got up off the floor, shaking with rage, looked at me and said, listen, you're a big kid. You hit hard. You could hurt me. You might even knock me out. But remember this. I'll get up. I'll come find you. I'll kill you. <clears throat> at the time, it was very intense. I took it as euphemistic. My mother took me aside at that point and said, look, you can't do this stuff with your father. And I was like, I know, it's so disrespectful, I feel horrible. Right? She's like, no, you know, dummy. He's a murderer. He's been to prison for murder. He's killed people. He might kill you. It's like, oh. <laughs> My entire childhood snapped clear. Boom, right there and then. I was like, oh, car exploding in driveway, moving all the time, dad's a murderer. Right, right. <laughs> I had to overlook some details. You know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, what I didn't know was that my mother uh, was leaving and that anger that he pointed at me was really about that. But it was the end of high school. I was about to graduate, and I was off to college, so I wasn't really much uh, invested in all that. And I left. I, I went to college, but I, I really lacked the, uh, the maturity to handle school and life on my own. And so after the first year, I dropped out, and I returned home. My mother was living across town with another man. I was living with my father, and he was giving ultimatums, you know. One day he, he said to me, he said, you know, my way or the highway. It was like right out of John Wayne's mouth, right? <laughs> and I was like, the highway. <laughs> and uh, at that point I moved into Boston. I was angry and I was looking for an outlet for my anger and I found it. I was about 19, I took a job bouncing at a, a now defunct punk bar called The Raft Geller. It was a dive bar, a den of iniquity, let's say. Uh, but that doesn't really describe the crowd. 
It was, you know, punk rockers, skinheads, off-duty cops, Red Sox fans, students. I mean, you name it, they were there, right? It was uh, an incredibly uh, tense environment at times, and it was, it was prone to uh, violent misgivings. And, and the violence there was, was rather intense. So I found what I was looking for. And I worked there for about two and a half years. And it was about that time. You know, was, I, I had a night off. I went into the bar. And a regular approached me. And um, he was like, hey, man, you know, I like the way you handle yourself. No, I was young. I was naive. And I was like, you want to go for a ride with me and my boys? I said, oh, yeah, sure, man. And we went outside and got in his car. And uh, I remember it was there with a number of other men in the car, and the doors locked, and everybody took out guns. I was like, hey, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> and they were like, oh, somebody owes us money. We're going to make an example out of them. I was like, oh. I knew I was uh, being dirtied up. You know, I knew enough to know that. <laughs> and I just sat there uh, and said nothing. And they drove to the place where this person was supposed to be. The target didn't show up. They drove back to the bar, and I got out of the car. I had dodged a major bullet. I was incredibly lucky and um, took the lesson to heart. <laughs> now, right about the same time, my mother was diagnosed uh, with cancer. What occurred was um, her, now the man she was living with, she ultimately married, but he, he, was, a, he was a Vietnam veteran, a Marine Corps uh, vet. Uh, he had been a medevac pilot uh, and had extreme PTSD. In the middle of a flashback one night, he punched her. He was about 300 pounds, about my height. My mother was about five foot two, maybe 105 or 110 pounds. Um, and then she started developing problems with her jaw. So they examined her and um, they initially misdiagnosed it as a jaw tension disorder. Diagnosis went unchecked and then ultimately it was revealed that it was a tumor in the palate of her, of her mouth. The doctors, they realized their mistake, and uh, they treated her. And the, and the treatment ultimately was going well. Uh, they performed um, a spinal surgery because the tumors had spread into her spine. And then they sent her off to a convalescence hospital. At the convalescence hospital, she developed a staph infection. The doctor said it was a terminal turn of events. They couldn't treat her with chemo because of the staph infection. Her immune system was too compromised. And even if they treated the staph infection and then returned to treat the cancer, it would just be too late. A number of days later, I was holding my mother's hand when she died. I was sitting on the edge of the bed, watching her take her last breaths. And I had a vision. I saw myself, and I saw my future, and I saw that I was on a path that was going to turn me into exactly the kind of man who had done this to my mother. And then she died, and I kissed her on the cold forehead, and I stepped back, and I realized I never wanted to hurt another person again. Right after my mother's funeral, I got out of Boston. I had to go. <laughs> I went to New Mexico with some friends. And we were there to build uh, a house for one of, one of our friend's mothers. But when we arrived, the mortgage fell through. <laughs> and I ended up stranded in Taos, New Mexico, in the middle of the desert, in a tent. As I was figuring out what I was supposed to do and how I was going to get out of this tough situation, one morning, somebody walked up and and knocked on my tent. They rapped on the fly. I said, hello, who's there? No response. Right. 
I assumed I was going to be attacked. I thought I was, I was in some trouble. So I opened the door, and there's my high school friend in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere. He's like, hey, your sister said you were stranded. He uh, got me a job where he was working at Ringling Brothers. <laughs> Strange turn of events. He was a clown. Um, he got me a job as a stagehand. And after a couple long months of working at Ringling Brothers, I wanted to go home. I told them I was leaving. I bought a bus ticket for Boston. I took a three-day bus ride to Boston. I got a great little apartment. I started writing. I started writing for real every day. You know, I even got a bouncing job back despite my conflicts, you know, emotionally with violence. And I was working construction. And at this point, I, I started to get a little audacious, a little youthful audacity, right? And I sent some poems to the New Yorker. Right? I was like, I'm going to take this seriously. And they sent them back with a form rejection letter, which was, you know, fine. I didn't expect an acceptance. But they'd also sent my poems back after they ran them through a shredder. And I stuffed them in the envelope. I got the message. <laughs> <laughs> get back to work, <laughs> right? And I, I, wouldn't send, uh, I wouldn't send my writing out for almost another 10 years. Uh, I, however, would spend almost every day sitting at my desk writing. This is where things took a dark turn. My roommates at this point in time developed a joint heroin habit. Our nice little apartment got kind of gloomy. The bills went unpaid. <laughs> and um, at this point in time, that same cousin who'd given me that enigmatic reading advice when I was younger called to see how I was doing. In the meantime, he'd become a lit professor and was living on a small farm in Poland. I told him about the circumstance, told him about my writing, and he invited me to live with him. A couple weeks later, I was on a plane flying to Europe. He met me, we went to his farm in Poland. We spent our days uh, working on his Prussian farmhouse. And in my free time, I wrote and read. And, and he critiqued my work and pointed me in the direction of important books. There were also writers living in the area and they'd stop by and we would talk writing. They told me I had talent and that I should go to school because in school I would achieve in four years what I might achieve on my own in 10. I came back to Boston, I took those lessons to heart. And a couple days after I landed, I walked into the admissions office at Suffolk University. I asked about enrolling at school. They showed me into an admissions counselor's office. He told me, you know, tell me your story. I did, I was like, all right, you seem serious. I'll take a chance, you can start in January. Four and a half years went by very quickly. I was a lit and history major and minor in creative writing. I graduated and I had no idea what to do. I returned to the world of construction. Spent two years there while I was still writing, I was still motivated, I was still inspired, but I was looking for my next point of access. So I started applying to writing programs and I got into one of the schools I wanted to go to. I got into Emerson College, I got their MFA program. I, I started in 2005, and when I graduated, I started teaching. I started teaching here at Suffolk. They hired me in the English department. I started teaching at Boston University. I, started, I taught at Leslie, and I was teaching writing uh, to the students, and I was listening to myself talk about literature and history, and I, I kept bringing up the law. So I went uh, to law school and got a JD. And when I finished my JD, I returned to teaching with a new set of tools. And that's essentially where I stand now. I got a job at Bridgewater. I continue teaching at Suffolk, continually sending out poems. And then last year, a publisher approached me about publishing a chapbook of my work, which is due out this year. And so I now find myself in a position that I would have thought audacious uh, uh, when I was a young man, a teacher, writing, getting published, 
it seemed impossible. There were certain saving graces in my youth. What they taught me was that grit wasn't enough. That you had to have something to be gritty for. And so what I've come away uh, through my experiences and through these moments that I've spent contemplating my experiences is an understanding that goes as follows. Grit in the absence of inspiration and access is not much use, except for mere survival, perhaps. And inspiration without grit and access, again, not much use. And then access without grit and inspiration, what is it but sort of an empty privilege? It's only in the combination of these three aspects, qualities, that I have been able to do what I've done. And I would argue this may not be a personal thing. I think these three qualities together are what is necessary for anybody to achieve what they want to achieve and for anybody to manifest their full potential. Thank you.